America. Only in 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 America. This week, our second episode in a multi-part series about those across the country helping evacuees after the U.S. military withdrawal from Afghanistan. Knowing there's very little you can do to help, probably not an uncommon experience for an immigration attorney in this nation, but actually being consulted about how to escape and remain alive and reach freedom, that's not a typical lawyer um, job, nor is it something we're experienced in doing. From the National Immigration Forum, I'm Ali Nirani, and this is Only in America. So a few weeks ago, I was in Akron, Ohio to speak at the Akron Roundtable. Before the talk, I participated in a private meeting of local business leaders, educators, and the city, along with Madhu Sharma, who is the executive director of the International Institute of Akron. It was a fascinating conversation. Around the room, the group was actively working to make sure that they and their respective organizations were ready to welcome, resettle, and support Afghan families who had been part of the August evacuation. So today, let's travel to Akron and talk to Madhu about the resettlement effort she is organizing in the International Institute, an organization that has been welcoming immigrants and refugees to the city for over 100 years. And now, they are showing up for Afghan evacuees. Well, it turns out that Madhu's family moved to Cincinnati from India when she was young. And she said that just like many families new to the U.S., there were ups and downs in adjusting to their new home. It was perfect, really, for my mom and for our family in terms of just she's from a part of India uh, and her family were farmers. So for us, for my mom, she easily found her community. Uh, for my dad, I think he struggled in a small town in Ohio. He had a harder time finding a sense of community because he was kind of a city kid. And, and also it was the 70s. It was a different time. There was no talk of integration. It was all assimilate, assimilate. Um, be like us and don't stand out. Um, so that was an era where nobody had ever eaten Indian food. Um, people weren't practicing yoga, all the things that are now cultural norms that are, I think, part of South Asian culture were not part of American culture yet. Um, so it was tough times, I think, and I couldn't wait to get out. But when I came back to Ohio, I was pleasantly surprised at how much even Ohio had changed. Before starting her work in Akron, she represented undocumented workers, refugees, and asylum seekers in California. She later returned to Ohio and became a welcoming face for Akron's refugee resettlement community. But things changed dramatically for their work in November 2016. It was very apparent that if at the outset of the Trump administration, there would be a clampdown on re family reunification. And our clients knew that. And I think they were watching the news and they understood that something was about to change in their lives. Um, then we spent the first few months just mobilizing quickly to help advise our community about what this new travel ban meant and what it meant for their families. We were advising people that were calling us from the airport that were trying to get back into the United States and were unable to. We'd already begun to resettle um, Syrian refugees and they suddenly were worried that they weren't going to get to reunite with family that they had left behind. Um, but there were also many, many refugees who were resettled whose reunification process with their spouses and their children went from an eight month, we're just kind of getting ready over the course of eight months, you get a job, you get a home, you, you get ready to invite the rest of your family. It's a very exciting time to be the first to plant roots here, but this that exciting time turned into a traumatic time because it was very quick that we learned based on the significant reduction in refugee resettlement numbers, the presidential determination in the first year of the Trump administration, it was a historic low for refugee resettlement. And then every year um, following up through fiscal year 2020, we kept hitting another historic low, another historic low, another historic low. And the lessons that they learned from their work since 2016 helped prepare the team for that ominous announcement that the U.S. military would withdraw 
from Afghanistan by September 11 of 2021. Well, obviously, immediately I thought about the humanitarian um, crisis that that was going to create. We had already, IIA had already resettled 200 or so, maybe a little bit less than 200 Afghan refugees and SIVs since 2013. Hmm. So we knew we already had a small community of Afghans who would be impacted and who had family ties and who were gonna be concerned about their family back home, just even friends and relatives. We immediately knew that we would have to, um, you know, determine how we were gonna be of help to those who were inside of Afghanistan seeking to evacuate. So our legal team was probably the ones who sought to mobilize the quickest. And, and uh, I, we immediately started legal clinics um, and engaging in outreach to our clients who we knew we had, but they were calling us to our phones are ringing yeah. off the hook. So we were really helping people and not pretending at all to be experts in how to evacuate Afghanistan. I don't think there was a person in this nation um, that was an expert on Afghan evacuation. So we were we we sought to be as responsibly providing you know the the information that we had on the ground and learning frankly from our um, community here about what was actually happening on the ground. Madhu and her team tried to have conversations that provided information, but also comfort to those seeking answers about their family's safety. We would learn before we would see on the news what was actually going on inside of Afghanistan. We usually were learning a day or two before the news cycle. Um, so, you know, you can only be reactive under those circumstances. But what we consistently sought to do was provide, um, you know, I'd say genuine advice to people, not pretending as if we IIA was going to have a solution for people who were seeking safety. That was very hard for my whole team because, you know, we're lawyers, we're not military personnel. Um, and having boundaries, knowing there's very little you can do to help, probably not an uncommon experience for an immigration attorney in this nation, but actually being consulted about how to escape and remain alive and reach freedom, that's not a typical lawyer um, job, nor is it something we're experienced in doing. So um, I was very proud of our team though. You know, we stayed in our lane. We didn't pretend to be experts, but we did help people um, by collecting their information, ensuring that our state department, our department of defense was aware of who was outside and our representatives. Madhu and her team are expecting to help resettle approximately 150 people in the next six months. 31 of those people are already in the pipeline, and more are expected to come very quickly. And we anticipate the numbers will begin to accelerate and people will start arriving more quickly in the, next, in the coming weeks. But we were typically resettling about 100, close to 100 in one year. So we, you know, in that era of resettlement, we were perceived to be a healthy resettlement agency, but that was a historic low for our organization. Right. We never resettled such small numbers. We had shifted most of our resources and our services to those who had already arrived, who, those who already lived in our community. Um, and now suddenly we're having to shift back to new arrivals. And obviously we don't want to um, take away from the programs we built up, but uh, it's, it's, it's difficult because you have to choose. You cannot fail um, it, the resettlement program because uh, you know that's where grassroots resettlement agencies are key to outcomes. Is you know how we serve in the initial nine or ninety days to a year is very impactful to a person's life in this country when they're new to the country. Part of that pressure is what comes next for families and individuals resettling in the U.S. Madhu and her team's two biggest worries are jobs and housing. We want to ensure that there's public health measures in place for those who are going to work, whether it be in manufacturing industries or hospitals or in the food industry, frankly. Um, but I think that the, another, I would say, economic and pandemic related concern that I think about all the time is housing, housing, housing. Are we going to have enough housing, affordable housing in Akron? Um, close enough to our agency um, to serve all the people that we're seeking to resettle with homes, right? Um, we don't, individuals pay for their own rent, but when there's a housing shortage, 
that strain, that financial strain can be very cumbersome. You know, affordable housing is key to this country, no matter who lives in the community. So the problems that the greater community is facing right now will be also felt by the people that we're seeking to resettle. One of the uh, strategies that we've that we've used that I think has been quite effective is that our U.S. ties are hosting their families and friends in those first few weeks while we secure permanent housing for people. And that that has a, you know, an added advantage of creating more of a welcoming environment for those who are coming. We're not having to put people in hotels quite frequently. That's pretty rare for us right now. Once those evacuees have been welcomed, finding a permanent solution is the next step in their journey. I think yeah. Most Americans hear the word parolee and they think of criminal justice system. So that already is a barrier because the perception is these people are, you know, they, they have, they've got something to redeem themselves from. They've done and something that is wrong. Not, yeah, and that's not the case at all. So yeah. unfortunately, that is the legal term that's ascribed to the individuals who come and seek asylum in our country. When you don't have a clear, smooth, and, and I would say easy pathway towards U.S. citizenship, there are significant barriers to access in every way that you live in this country. Uh, we're fortunate that the continued resolution that passed last week is, is allowing Afghans who come as parolees to get driver's licenses and identification cards, but typically a parolee doesn't have that access. And that was a recent development. Um, and we also, uh, that resolution also ensures that uh, parolees will then have to apply for asylum in the United States and that they have a streamlined pathway towards asylum, which means within 45 days, they have to be interviewed. And then within 150 days, that's five months, their applications have to be adjudicated. But um, that asylum status, you know, there's not enough officers to adjudicate asylums. And even though they're deploying money towards that, we well know that there is already over um, 386,000 people stuck in our asylum, affirmative asylum system. There's already a significant backlog. Uh, and while Afghan nationals might get a leg up because they're supposed to be adjudicated quickly, the adjudications may not be consistent. Um, we're really concerned about how they're intending to adjudicate. While the red tape surrounding resettlement efforts will prove to be a difficult hurdle, Madhu says Akron's support of evacuees has been overall extremely welcoming. There has been an outpouring of support. We have so many donated items and our community mobilized. They collected and gathered and even stored donated items so that we're able to set up homes. When we're able to find permanent housing, we're able to set up homes with the, bare, the essentials. Um, and I, I anticipate it's gonna continue that outpouring of support. We've also had an uptick in financial donations, which we very well need because that helps us in terms of capacity building. Um, and we've also had significant outreach from organizations, local schools, um, organizations that are not traditionally our partners, IIA's partners have sought, reached out, um, asked how they can help. And probably the most important would be there, there's employers in our community who um, see, I think they see an opportunity to, to do something of impact. Um, corporations who want to be connected to the Afghan communities that IIA resettles have reached out to see how they can help. So we've had this outpouring of support and we've also had local, um, our local government has been significantly supporting us as well. And our, our city council has passed a resolution. Um, we know that we need a community. I can't do the work alone, which is what gives me some confidence that despite the chaos on the national level, um, Akron may, we may be able to organize and mobilize to do this work well as a community. Madhu Sharma is the executive director of the International Institute of Akron. You can learn more about their work at our website, immigrationforum.org slash podcast. And if you like what you hear, number one, visit Akron. But number two, subscribe to Only in America, wherever you are listening to this episode. Only in America is produced and edited by Katie Lutz, Joanna Taylor, and Becca Wall. Our artwork and graphics are designed by Carla Leha. I'm Ali Nirani, and I will talk to you next week. 
Support for the National Immigration Forum comes from the Carnegie Corporation of New York, supporting innovations in education, democratic engagement, and strengthening international peace and security. And from Humanity United. When humanity is united, we can bring a powerful force for human dignity. 